The Technique Series is brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching. Did you know that you can get a 100% free form check from one of our expert strength coaches? Seriously, absolutely 100% free. No credit card needed, no questions asked. Just go to barbelllogic.com slash technique and sign up for the free Barbell Logic experience now. Do that right now and then enjoy the show. Welcome to Barbell Logic Rewind. This is the Barbell Logic Podcast. I'm Scott Hambrick, and this is Matt Reynolds. And today we're going to talk about the squat. We should have talked about it, I don't know, back in July. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. The squat. Yeah. It uh, seems simple, right? But there's a lot to be said about this. For sure. We do four main lifts, and the king of all these lifts is the squat. We focus everything that we do around that thing, everything mm-hmm. we really... How about this? Everything we do might be an accessory to the squat. <laughs> That's okay. It's fair. Maybe. Sure. I'll just sit back here and I'll just let you tell us about the squat. So the place that you have to start w- with any of these lifts is we start with the three primary criteria. And uh, in one of our very first uh, podcasts, we talked about the three criteria that we use to get strong in the most efficient manner. Right. And so those three criteria are... All of our listeners should be saying this along with us. Yeah, right? they know. We use the uh, most... We want to move as much weight as possible over the with the most muscle mass over the longest effective range of motion. That's right. So uh, if you think about, for those of our listeners, you think about somebody maybe like your mom. Um, your mom. <laughs> and uh, Or someone just doesn't know, you know, and they walk in on January 1st because they've got a New Year's resolution and they walk into a gym and uh, they don't know where to start, and there are an infinite number of exercises they could do. And, uh, you know, obviously there's some free weights, but your mom's probably not going to even try to do the free weights, but there are hundreds of exercise machines, and there are potentially hundreds of cardio machines. And, right. And where, where would you start? I mean, it's, it's literally infinite. And so um, we use these, these three criteria where we go, okay, well, we're going to, of, of all these infinite number of exercises we could choose from, in order to get the most bang for our buck, uh, the greatest return on investment for the least effective dose. We love that training economy. Yeah, the training economy, we're going to pick exercises that use the most muscle mass, number one, right? So the easy way to think about most muscle mass is what exercises make the most joints move, bend, right? Again, I'm going to just make this as simple as I can, right? right? right. If I'm doing a one-arm dumbbell curl and only my left elbow is moving... Only one joint is moving. Right, because muscles only serve to extend or flex a joint. That's the only thing they're there for. Right, or abduct or adduct or rotate or whatever. So they make joints move. That's what they do. That's it. Right, so they cross joints. Now, some muscles cross more than one joint. Some muscles only cross a a single joint. Uh, But what I want to do in order to use the most muscle mass is I want to pick the movements that make the most joints move, and then I use the most muscle mass. So something like a squat where the bar's on my back – I have six joints that are going through a, a pretty big range of motion, both my hips, both my knees, and both my ankles. But not only that, the prime movers of a squat are those muscles around the hips. We'll, we'll get there here in a minute. But that's not where the bar sits. The bar doesn't sit on my hips. The bar sits up on the spine of my scapula, just below the spine right. of my scapula, you know, just below the shoulders. So then, not only we have all these joints flexing that you already named, but we have to then hold all of our spine in isometric contraction. So all those muscles on our back are working really hard exactly to right. prevent the flexion, actually. Our muscles can contract in isometric contraction much harder than they can in concentric contraction, too. That's right. So the back, uh, the trunk, uh, really performs isometrically in a, in a squat. It does not in, in several of the exercises. And so um, a squat's a, a good first place to start. Um, and then we, we go to that second criteria, where uh, the most weight, that's the easy one, right? So uh, a, a, an air squat will not make me as strong as a 405-pound squat. But, okay. Right. Do we need, does that need any further in- <laughs> explanation? I mean, it's, it's pretty easy. If the goal is to get strong, right? We've already talked through on the podcast why strength. Like why strength is better than... It's the, it's yeah, the, go back to episode... One. One. Yeah, is that, is that, <laughs> I is that, is that it? I think it's yeah. why strength. Right. Uh, yeah, it's a foundational episode. Uh, so we, we know, and, and it sounds awful by the way, 
You know, the, the quality, the oh, audio sure quality has just gotten sure. better. And of we, course. we're a little better doing it, maybe. Yeah, we were we were sitting in a bathtub. For, <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> for, the, for the acoustics. No, so, like, like Bert and Ernie. Yeah, the, then the other thing that you think about with weight is like, think about potential weight that you could use, right? So can I squat more weight than I can leg extension? Sure. Yes. You betcha. At, at least at, in a trained individual, right? Right. And so... Uh, so I'm going to look at, uh, well, squat makes more joints move, and I move a lot of weight with a squat, and I want to move as much weight as I can. No. Yep. Hey, hey, what about the high bar west side guys, wide stance, yep. and they move, Chris Steffen moves a ton of weight. Yeah. So, well, that's the last criteria. We look at the most, the greatest effective range of motion. Hmm. So the greatest effective range of motion says, well, I'm, it sounds I want like to- somebody's thought these three criteria through or something. Yeah. Yeah, so the question you know that people are going to be thinking about when you talk about using exercises that that picking exercises and performing exercises in a way that uses the most muscle mass and with the greatest weight, the greatest gonna, weight. Yeah. You're going to have a lot of people ask, "Well, yeah, but West Side squats this much and Chris Duffin squats this much. They take a really wide stance and they right. don't do it like you guys do and and why?" And so uh, this greatest effective range well, of Well, then why? The troll just says you know, spread That's your goddamn it. feet out, st- you know, put sure. the bar on your top of your head and high bar it for big numbers. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the thing that we have to understand that we're trying to do is that there's a difference between trying to make somebody generally strong and trying to lift the most weight in a competitive performance event. In a game. In a game. Right. right? And so powerlifting actually gets rid of that greatest effective range of motion criteria. What they do is actually try to try to lift using the least legal range of motion. Right. The only criteria is move the weight, most weight possible within the confines of the rules That's of right. their, their sport. That's, That's it. Right. So if I'm 6'1 and I take a really wide stance and I squat at 6'1 and really wide stance, I'm not 6'1 anymore, I'm 5'7. Right. And, the, and I've artificially shortened the legs. And artificially shortened the legs lets the bar move less. So I could theoretically move more weight, a less range of motion, but it's less work and it doesn't get work. me generally as strong. And so then the question is, what are we trying to do? Well, we're trying to train force production. That's right. Force times distance, that work number to be as high as we can. We bring those feet in a little bit and uh, get that longest effective range of motion. We want to stand all the way up. Sure. And, and we want to squat below parallel. How many potential novices are there in the world? All of them. Seven billion almost. Right. Yeah. Almost. Billions. Yeah. How many competitive, how many people, advanced powerlifters are? How there? many people do you think have done LP, at least sort of? I think broadly defined as doing it, broad as broad as you want. God, there couldn't be more than a million and a half people. Yeah, I was going to say a million, probably, right? Maybe. And so, uh, when we use these criteria, right, where the idea is, the vast majority of people who are going to attempt this. Their goal is not to become a competitive power lifter. It's to become generally strong. Right. And with general strength increases come a uh, quality of life increase. For most of them, a health increase. You bet. Um, Then our goal is to get people generally strong and to get generally strong. We perform exercises. We perform the movements that use the most muscle mass with the most weight for the greatest effective range of motion. And when we do those things, we can take that infinite number of exercises in a gym all those machines, all that cardio equipment, all those dumbbells, all the kettlebells, all that kind of stuff, and we compare it all the way down. And right. we end up with four or five lifts that are the biggest bang for our buck that we get this training economy. And the best of all... The, the biggest bang... Is the squat. The squat. It's a squat. It's the hardest lift. It uses the most muscle mass of anything... Right, and particularly the low bar squat uses the most muscle mass. Yeah, so we'll that's get the there. other... Yeah, well, the, the so, yeah there's... So, Let's just start with the squat. Let's just start with any squat, right? The squat in general is going to move the bar a greater effective range of motion than a deadlift. Right. And it's going to lift almost as much weight as a deadlift, right? So you've got all this work and all this weight and all these joints move through a big range of motion. That's why it's the king of all exercises. It's goddamn, it's harder than anything else. Yeah. It, your body responds to it in a way that, no, that it won't respond to any other lift. Now, from that point forward, we look at the squat and we go, well, now how do we perform the squat under the same three criteria? Because now there are nearly an infinite number of ways we can perform a squat. They're abounded by a couple of things. There's physics. We live in a world right. that has rules. So gravity's pulling down. 
So, so what? So what's the first rule that's really inarguable with gravity and the squat? You have to keep the bar of your midfoot. Right? Is that ar- Have you heard that argued? I mean, that's not really argued. <laughs> that's crazy even that it was even. People that would argue with us about low bar versus high bar. Your high bar advocates are still going to say, well, the high bar still stays over the middle of your foot. Right. So you keep the bar of your foot, right? So if you stand up and you lean forward to put the, you can feel your weight shift to the balls of your feet. You can imagine if you had a bar on your back, weighed 405, you're fixing to go onto your face. And if you rock back onto your heels, you can feel that, you can feel that gravity vector move back. The pressure on your foot tells you where your center of gravity is. And you rock back and the pressure's even on the bottom of your foot. Your center of gravity is right over your middle of your foot. We want to keep that bar over the middle of your foot. And that's how you know it's there. You can feel the pressure on the bottom of your foot. So a correct squat, regardless of the style of squat, must stay over the middle of your foot. This is yep. inarguable. Front squat, high bar squat, low bar squat, box squat, any of those squats, yep. safety squat, bar squat, any of those goofy ass squats, all stuff stay over the middle of your foot in order to work in the most efficient manner against gravity. If gravity is going to pull straight down, the bar needs to move straight up against gravity, directly over the middle of the foot, and that's inarguable. Now, the question is this. How do we adjust the squat to go back to criteria number one to be able to use the most muscle mass, Mm -hmm. right? So our argument is, is that when you do the low bar squat, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take that bar. If somebody goes in and you, you take some fifth grader, and you say, hey, you just go squat, right? He's going to go put a bar on top of his, on top of his traps at the base of his like neck. Like a yoke. Like a yoke, not just a fifth grader or anybody. An untrained squat, that's where they put it. It just feels like that's where you should go. And the first thing they're going to go, ah, oh, it hurts. Where's that, that pad? I've seen oh, that pad. Man, where that is thing, it? that bump on the back of my neck, it hurts. Like, well, that's not where the bar goes. So we put the bar below, just below the spine of the scapula. So if you reach over, you take your off hand, you reach over there, you can feel a horizontal ridge of bone on your your, uh, your shoulder blade back yeah, there. Yeah, shoulder blade. And you can dig your fingers under it. And that, that place right there, that's where we put the bar. Yeah, so most people like go back to the kind of idea of our moms walking into a gym and trying to figure out what exercise to do. Our moms know that there is such a thing as a shoulder blade or a scapula. Mm-hmm. Most of them are only aware of sort of the medial inferior aspect of the scapula. Would it feel like that's true? Like, they know where the inside of your shoulder blades are and the bottom of your shoulder blades. The thing that we typically do now is we'll actually pull somebody off the front row and we'll take that scapula and we'll actually put it on their back. Yeah, they, they we'll put it on their back. Right? We'll go, here's right here. This is the thing, right? And, yeah. so, and so we show them this is where the bar goes. And when we put the bar at that point, just below the spine of the scapula, then that's the lowest point on the back that the bar can be without rolling down the back in the middle of the squat. Right. The musculature of the posterior delts and the upper back, the rhomboids, will create a shelf for that bar to sit on. It it really doesn't even matter how muscular you are, right? We've seen these like skinny little girls and it sits on those things and they're okay. They're fine. So that bends somebody over. Now think about this. If the bar is up on your traps, up and, high. And it has to stay over your midfoot. Then your, then your back is going to be more vertical. Your back is going to be more upright. And as the bar comes down your back, you've got to bend over more to keep the bar over the middle of your foot, which means if your back is bent over more, your back is more horizontal, you have more moment to overcome on the back, which means the back gets more work. Yep. The argument from the chiropractor and physical therapist and all those sort of people is, that, holy shit, you're going to f*** your back up doing that. Only right. what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make your back strong. Right. We want to train the back. And the only way you can do that is put stress on it. That's to That's load it. the back. I hope you're enjoying this episode in the technique series of the Barbell Logic podcast. You know, at Barbell Logic, we believe that barbell-based strength training is literally for everyone, and that the only thing holding most people back from all the incredible benefits that come from it is good technique and consistency, and we can help with that too. And whether you're just getting started or you've been lifting for a while, it's difficult to know if you're performing the lifts correctly or if there's anything you can do to make your lifting better. We have tons of free resources online, from basic how-to videos that'll get you lifting safely and efficiently right away, the podcasts, articles, and videos that will help you troubleshoot common errors. All you have to do is visit barbelllogic.com slash technique to see our best technique-focused content in one place. And while you're at it, 
you can sign up for a consultation with a Barbell Logic coach. This is a free form check and a chance to ask an expert all your training related questions. There's no reason you should be struggling to get started or to make progress. Check out barbelllogic.com slash technique for more information and sign up for the Barbell Logic experience. Again, it's 100% free. There's nothing better for your training than knowing you're lifting safely, training efficiently, and on the right track. All right, let's get back to the show. I have heard more times in the last couple of years that squats are bad for the knees nearly as much as I hear that back squats are bad for the back and you should front squat. Yep. Well, if you just front squat, it's okay. It won't hurt. You won't, you won't, won't load your back. No, I'm trying to load your back. Right. I'm trying to put moment force. I'm trying to put rotation. I'm trying with the barbell to fold your ass in half with the barbell and make you fight against that because right. when you fight against that, you know what happens? You get generally strong. Your back gets strong. Right. And when your back gets strong, your back gets, oh my God, less vulnerable to injury, not more vulnerable to injury. The bar position, the, the placement of the bar on the back, it literally, the entire geometry of the squat stems from that. If the back, if the bar is up high, the back is more upright. If the back is more upright in order to keep the bar of the middle of the foot, something else has to go forward. The knees end up going forward. And so now I get more moment on the knees. If the bar comes down the back, bends the back over, oh, you know what happens? The ass sits back, my butt sits back, and it puts more moment on the hips. Leverage, right? It's yep. not quite the same thing as torque, but most of the people that are listening in that, and they think about this rotational force like a torque wrench, it's kind of a similar concept, right? So when the, when the rump goes back, you lean over more, there's more, more moment on that back segment. That's right. Yeah, so let's, let's flesh that out real yeah. quick. So the hamstrings cross two major joints, right? The hamstrings cross the hips, and they originate at the ischial tuberosity, right? At the, at the seat bones, at the sit bones, at the place. When you're sitting on a chair, not your tailbone, but where you can actually feel your butt bones on both the right and left side f touching the, the chair right now. Yep. You can feel it. That's where they originate. And so they cross the hip, but then they don't end on the femur. They cross the knee as well, and they insert the semi- Tenonosis and semimembranosis insert on the tibia and the biceps femoris inserts on the fibula, if I remember right. So the hamstring makes the hips go from flexion to extension. It straightens the hips and it makes the knees go from extension to flexion. It bends the knee. In a squat, when you're standing up, because the hips are in extension and the knees are in extension, then it is essentially shortened superior on, the, on the, its origination, right? And it's is that right? Yeah. And lengthened on, on the far side. But as you bend into your squat and the hips begin to bend and, ex and go into flexion and the knees go into flexion, the hamstrings lengthen on one end and shorten on the other end, which means ultimately the hamstrings stay the same length, which means they don't, in fact, contribute to hip extension as much as they function isometrically. They hold your, your knee joint together, right? Sure. They, right. So the hamstrings. So if you keep if you the, load those hamstrings correctly, you tip that the ischial tuberosity away from the knee. Hamstrings get really tight and long, and they take and they take that all that load so that your ACL doesn't have to. Right. Sure. Sure. That certainly they they keep the tibia from sliding forward is one of the things that the hamstring is going to do. So this guy who doesn't even have an ACL in one of your knees can still squat that low bar squat. Sure. And so what we're able to do is we're able to, again, place that, those long moment arms on the hamstrings, on the hips, uh, and so that the glutes adductors, adductors, growing inside of the thighs, are able to contribute to hip extension as much as possible. Now think about this. Think it just, even if you don't know your anatomy, think about the size of the musculature on the inside of your thighs, on the back of your thighs, and on your butt. Right. That's a lot of muscle. If I decide to right. not squat the way we're saying and to high bar squat and put the long moment arm at the knee from the knee to the bar path, then that takes all that moment and transitions it off of the hip and onto the knee. Now, here's the thing. The quads are big old muscles, too. Not that big, though. Not compared to the hamstrings and the glutes and the adductors. Everybody remembers from fifth grade that your glutes are the biggest muscle in your body. That's right. Everybody remembers right. laughing about that. That's right. We're trying to do a low bar squat because it uses the most muscle mass. As we put the bar in a low bar position, it allows us to sit back, bend over, take a lot of that 
moment, force that leverage off the knee, place it on the hips where the greatest musculature is. And because I'm using the greatest musculature, the most muscle mass, the greatest effective range of motion, I in I can then lift the most weight. Now, let's focus for a second on the greatest effective range of motion. Why don't I squat all the way down to my feet? Why don't I do ass to grass squats? Ain't effective. Why? Why is it less effective? Why is the greatest effective range of motion not the greatest range of motion? Well, your, hamstr- your hamstrings have to get loose. The hamstrings will be shorter in an ass to grass squat than in a low bar squat stop just below parallel. Here's why I think that is, because it points that ischial tuberosity back posteriorly. And as you go all the way down, that thing points down and the, isch- the ischium turns and becomes closer to the knee. And so right. if the knee and the ischium are closer together, the hamstring has to be shorter. So we, we want people to fix their back angle, right? And then hit below parallel and then drive the hips back up. To get ass to grass, they can't keep that back angle. Right. Because they're their chest would be below their knees. Right. But I think that's where the fact that they get more vertical as they break parallel there in that astrograph squat, I think is where those hamstrings end up getting slack. Right. Would would get slack. Yeah. Because the two joint muscles have a lengthening and a shortening on one end or the other. So you're you're buying some in one on one side and losing some on the other side with those regardless. It it may or may not be a wash, but it's not a complete loss like it is across one joint. Right. Yeah. Yeah, That makes sense. And so, so how the hell does somebody squat? Can we say anything about that? So if you want to go do a low bar squat, we've already talked about putting it yep. below the spine of your scapula. Now you walk yep. it out of the rack and what the heck are you going to do? Yeah, You're so going to break it, your knees and hips simultaneously. At the exact same time. So the knees and the hips break at the exact same time. And, and this Where is, are their feet? Uh, the, their heels are going to be about shoulder width apart, right? And their toes are going to be out about 30 degrees, right? Would you, and, and would you say their that, heels are going to be like under their armpit? Uh, that's fair, I guess. If you say, hey, I want you to stand a shoulder with the Bart, they stand too narrow, right? Like most yeah, of the time. Yeah, I've noticed that. Why is that? I don't know. They don't know where their shoulders are. I, I think so. So I, I, I think if I tell them, hey, you know, kind of put your heel under your armpit, they, they tend to get closer to ride. <laughs> yeah. Right. So yeah, your toes are going to be out at 30 degrees. We know that your knees want to track the same direction as your toes. We want our knees to go out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that oh, knee's a wonderful hinge so joint. It's not scissoring. made. It's not made to have torsion. So you walk the thing out. Yep. Spine below the spine of the scapula. Yep. Heel take a deep the breath. width apart. Toes out thirty degrees. <gasps> yep. And Big we'll, breath. We'll talk about the Valsalva in an upcoming podcast. You, you break at the knees and hips at the same time. Ass back. Like you were going to do a standing long jump, right? Sure. Knees and knees and hips break at the same time. Ass back. Ass knees back. out. Nipples yep. down. That's it. While keeping your back flat. I tell them, put your shoulder blades in your back pockets, hold that, yeah, break like it. the knees and hips. So, yeah. I mean, whatever. We've all got our... So, the, the idea is everyone knows, e- even my mom knows, you're not supposed to round your back on a, on a squat. Mm-hmm. But she also thinks that that means that she has to keep her chest pointed at the wall in front of her. And that's not the same thing. Got to be a coach. Yeah, if you're in person, I'll put my hand on the small of your back and my and I tell them, hold this. Your back is a beam. I shove my finger in the sure. hip joint. I'm like, you're going to pivot here, but your back is a beam. Sure. You've got a really good cartoon that I stole, the little cartoon picture that you use online that's like actually shows a guy, like here's a rounded back and here's an arched back. Oh, yeah. Sometimes yeah. I just don't even think they know what that means. Yeah. And so, ah, oh, I get it, you know? And so uh, sometimes I'll say, like, if you pour water on your back, I, w- I want it to hold. <laughs> I want the water to sit and pool. Right. When we do those things, when we squat, we go down, ass back, knees out, nipples down. We set our back, we set the back angle in the first third of the descent, and we set the knees forward and out in the first third of the descent, and the knees don't move for the rest of the squat. And the back angle doesn't move for the rest of the squat. So the back angle, for those of you guys watching on video, the back angle goes like this. And it goes all the way down, and it comes all the way back up, same angle, same angle, same angle, and then stands up at the end, and that's it. And so easy. The thing that makes it do that is the infamous hip drive. The hip drive allows you to maintain the back angle and make sure that the moments that the muscles around the hips are the thing that's doing the primary work. If I come up out of the bottom of the hole by lifting my chest and scooping my butt up underneath me. Your knees are going to shoot forward. Exactly right. And, and I take, I take up. all that moment or all that leverage off of the hips. I put it on the knees where I don't actually want it. So that's how we squat. Now, here's the bigger question. What is the effect of this lift on your training, on your life, on your, of the squat? For most people, it's, well, it's probably the hardest thing they've ever done. Oh, it is for it, me. And, uh, you know, I want to talk about the stretch reflex. So, you know, most people we get do exactly what you're talking about. 
they lower mm. too fast and they bounce off their knees. Look, you're, if you're gonna if you're bouncing, you're bouncing off something. The problem is if you're bouncing off your knee tendons and your quads. <laughs> Now what I have to do is I have to walk you back through and I have to slow it all down. Right. And I have to take the bounce completely off. You know why I have to do that? Because they can't feel that in the bottom, the weight shifts from their midfoot to their toe, right. the baller foot, and the barbell slides forward and then pops back up. And so I, okay, now I've got to make sure you can feel that you're on your midfoot all the way down and all the way back up and all the way down. All the way. And then I, all right, let's speed that up 10%. And another ten so, percent. So and when then we get to the point where they can actually bounce off their off their adductors, glutes, hips, right, whatever. We were just I was just talking to Chase. You know, when he comes up, he locks the bar, he locks his squat out so hard, the bar is just uh, uh. It's so rattling. I was like, Man, your your knees, buddy, like that ain't gonna be good eventually. He's like, Yeah, my knees hurt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's just too violent in his He's just too explosive. Yeah. And he's 42, and he's got these seven beautiful little blue-eyed, toe-headed kids. Yeah. And a knee replacement. <laughs> Good. So that's a squat, man. I love it. So that's how you squash everybody. Uh, yeah. That's what you do the first, uh, the first right out of the gate every session for yeah. the rest of your life. Forever. Forever. The king of lifts. Well, this is the Barbell Logic Podcast. I'm Scott Hambrick, and this is Matt Reynolds. You can follow Reynolds at Reynolds Strong on Instagram, and I'm at Scott underscore Silver Strength there, too. So thanks so much for listening. Go give us some reviews. Go to iTunes and give us five stars if you like it. Please subscribe. If you're an occasional listener, man, go hit that subscribe button and uh, tell a friend about us. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.